Good afternoon. Oh, we got to try that again. Good afternoon. Welcome to Promises in Apex. My name is Kevin Porman. If you were looking for the session about how to use Cody the Bear to order pizza whenever your cat comes in after being recognized with Einstein, that's over there. I'm a technical evangelist with the Salesforce uh, ISV team. So I spend most of my days working with ISV partners to help them be successful on the platform. So if you've ever come across a managed package and wondered how does that get made, I'm the guy who knows and has worked with those partners to get those made. Uh, when I was a kid, I really loved to get uh, mail. And now that I'm older and I get bills in the mail, I don't like to get mail at all. And I really like to get tweets. So if, you would, uh, if you're interested in it, feel free to look me up on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle there is at the bottom, at CodeFryer. It's also on the back of my laptop, thanks to an artsy, craftsy relative. Um, we're going to uh, be talking about Promises and Apex today. Uh, is anybody familiar with Promises? just as a, a baseline thing? Okay, well first off, before we can get into the really interesting stuff, we have to go through the legal unit test. Our lawyers worked really hard to come up with all of this wall of text that breaks every single rule about the number of syllables you're supposed to have on a slide. It's a completely engaging reading. I encourage you to read it anytime. But now, the gist of it is that we may be talking about some things that are coming and are not yet released. You need to be making all of your purchasing decisions based off of what is currently generally available. Everybody okay with that? Awesome. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about what the problem is, asynchronous programming. We're going to talk about what a promise is made of, what its anatomy is. We're going to talk about the real power of promises and how to use them. We're going to go through the most important slide in this deck. And then we're going to speak about lightning and promises for just a few seconds. And then we're going to go into great detail about how you can do promises in Apex. And at the very end, there will be um, resources and some Q&A. If you don't ask me questions, I will ask you questions. That can always get awkward. Okay, so feel free to, to uh, come up with the questions, and at any time, feel free to heckle, all right? Good deal. So what is the problem? Uh, I work with a, a group called Pets for Patriots. They're an interesting non-for-profit. They're based out of New York City, and what they do is they work to um, basically bring at-risk shelter animals, mostly dogs and cats, but occasionally we have a ferret or a parrot, I don't know why they rhyme, slip in, and uh, they, they pair those at-risk shelter animals with veterans, um, either active duty military or people who have uh, left the military, either retired or, or just uh, mustered out. Now, uh, we, don't do, we don't do therapy animals, we do companion animals. And as part of setting up this charter and going through the process of becoming a nonprofit, there were a lot of uh, rules and restrictions from the original founders that they wanted to make sure happened. And one of the ones that we had was that you have to have a veterinary partner and a shelter partner within a reasonable driving distance of the veteran who wants to participate. So the, the workflow goes something like this. We have somebody say, hey, I, I think this is a great program. I'm ex-military. I want to adopt a dog. Great. I'm going to put in my address. That address is going to be uh, geolocated. We then have to say, okay, great. Here are the partners that are within a certain radial distance of you. We have thousands of partners, and so we, we can't distance search all of them every time somebody signs up. So we radial search to limit the search results to look for. And then we do a driving distance search. And when we come back from that, we get to correlate some data. We have to say, okay, this driving distance equals the distance between this address and the Patriot, et cetera. And finally, uh, if everything goes okay, if there's at least one veterinary partner and one shelter partner, we can sort of automatically approve the case. We can drop it into a, a, work, a approval workflow and just automatically approve it if those are met. Um, this generally takes about 45 minutes if you sit down and do this manually. So you get, a, you get, the, it, you get the case in, it's got the Patriot's address on the contact record, you're flipping back and forth between a case record and a contact record, and you're looking things up, copying and pasting over into Google Maps and figuring out where the geolocation that long is and then using a, an ISV tool um, called uh, uh, GeoPoint to, to pull up things that are within a certain radius and then trying to figure out which ones are actually within that driving distance. And that can be actually kind of confusing because you can, and sometimes you have to override it because we ha will have uh, a driving distance search that comes back and says, hey, they are way out of range. And you look at them on the map and they're literally 
across the street. And you're scratching your head, and then finally you realize that it's a one-way street. And in order to route them back around to go across the street by driving, not walking, you actually have to go outside the driving distance radius. So this is, this is the problem that, uh, this, that I set out to solve when I started working with them. And when we completed this, as you'll see here in a little bit, it takes approximately from 45 minutes down to about 35 seconds. So how do we do this? We do this with promises. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what promises are. I like to say this is the anatomy slide. Uh, a, a promise is a weird cross between a state machine that has three states, pending, fulfilled, and done. As you might imagine, pending means it's not actually done resolving to a value. Fulfilled means it has a value, and the rejected state means that there was some sort of error along the way. Now, a promise represents the eventual value of some asynchronous work. And that's a complicated sentence. Let me try that again. A promise is just that, a promise of an eventual value of some asynchronous work. So when that kicks off, your little state machine and uh, data structure says, okay, I'm gonna go do some asynchronous work, and then I'm, I'm gonna have a method called then, usually, um, that's convention, to, to attach some work to it. And if you've ever done work in JavaScript, you'll, you'll recognize the idea of doing some callback work when an asynchronous bit is done. Uh, this is a different way of thinking about it, and we'll get into why that works here in a little bit. But this is the basic understanding of what a promise is. A state machine with a data structure that's going to do some asynchronous work, and it's going to resolve into either a done value or a rejected error. So what makes promises powerful, and why are they, why are they better than callbacks? That is a religious argument up there with Vim versus Emacs. But so we, we won't go into that. But I will talk about what promises are and why I think they're very powerful. So let's look at a, a simple promise chain here. We've got a first promise, then it's going to make an API callout, and it's going to return a second promise. Now that second promise is going to execute, and it's going to return a third promise. And the third promise is going to actually do some work inside Salesforce. So this is a very contextual example, but if you notice what I skipped over or just sort of glossed over is that one promise can return a promise and because of that you can chain them together. There is an upper boundary to what you can, how many you can chain together in Apex, but it's pretty large. And this is, I, this, I refer to this as chaining, or the, the power of promises in, is in their chaining. And we'll see how this builds and builds uh, as we go through here. So let's take a little bit, uh, let's take a look here at some code. This is a developer conference after all. And let's put this in context. This is in JavaScript. The idea here is we're gonna, we're gonna talk about promises in JavaScript, sort of the lingua franca of the internet, and then we'll jump into Apex here as well. So this is a basic promise chain, and you'll see that we've got some method here HTTP get, which is going to return a promise. Now that method can return a promise however it works in, in JavaScript here, but we're then going to call the then method. And that then method is going to be going to contain an anonymous function, and that anonymous function you'll see there also calls HTTP get. So we're going to make API call one. With the results of that, we'll make an API call, a second API call. And finally, when we get done with that second API call, then we're going to log the status code. Pretty simple, right? How does everyone feel about this? Okay, good. Some advantages over callbacks. We're not, promises don't exist to try and help you eliminate callbacks. That's not their, their purpose. What they try to do is try to help you make sense of your asynchronous code so that you can work through it easier and faster. Asynchronous is hard, let's try and make it as easy as possible. So when you talk about using the then method, you can use those anonymous, um, excuse me, you can use those anonymous functions to call secondary promises, like we do in this case. This is from an Angular app I worked on. And if you switch over to not using anonymous functions, if you use named functions like we do here, get departure, get flight, get weather, and persist data, what you can actually do is write a promise chain that looks like that. And that's a lot easier to reason about and to work through. How is everybody feeling about that? That was sort of a big shift there. All right? Now, using uh, named functions is really powerful. And what they do, and this is that most important slide here, is when you use a named function and promises together, you actually enable what's called monadic composition. 
Monadic composition is a big, it's a PhD word phrase for a really simple like kindergarten concept that means I'm going to tie a whole bunch of things together in order and I'm going to call that its own thing. I'm going to have a function that does A, B, C, D and then when my function D is over, that my function is going to return, my, my monadic function is going to return. Um, monads come from functional programming. If you've never played around with functional programming, it's, it's a, a little bit of a mind trip at the beginning. But monadic composition is my favorite feature of uh, functional computing, functional programming. They allow us, uh, we have the, the promise concept and our named functions, and together we can actually put together a monad, a process of asynchronous code and synchronous code, if we choose to mix it in, that it executes, and it doesn't matter how long it takes to execute each individual step. So let's take a look about let's take a look at this um, with some some monadic composition in here. So uh, if you look at this, this is actually from Lightning. This is a little bit different than anything you'll see today. Lightning can use promises, but it's not uh, as as pretty as I like to say as pure JavaScript promises or or Apex promises. We're we're going to look here, and and I'm going to try and uh, use my laser pointer here. We've got a, a function that returns a promise, and then it's going to attach an anonymous function through the, a, the dollar sign a get callback method. So if you've been writing uh, Apex, excuse me, if you've been writing Lightning JavaScript, you're probably very familiar with this right here. And you, you use that as your anonymous function. Okay, it's a little bit, little bit different. Now the other thing that's really important about Lightning is that when you have an error, your error is attached as a second or a get callback function that is right after your initial promise. So if you want to attach an error handler to your promise, that's how you do it here in Lightning. All right now this is, uh, this is promises in Apex, so that's all I'm really going to say about Lightning. Happy to talk to you about it afterwards, though, if you have questions. So how do we do promises in Apex, and is this even really possible? Uh, there are lots of ways of doing the promise pattern and implementing it in a programming language, but fundamentally any programming language that has a construct for asynchronous programming or asynchronous execution and enforces array order can be used to build out a promise system. So that's how promises in Apex work. And so in Apex, we're going to use queuable Apex as the asynchronous execution method, and we're going to use a list of a given type for our actual promises to, to set up the order of execution. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I wrote a promises library uh, along with uh, some help from another guy. This is my shameless plug and uh, also where I'm supposed to flip over to the code here. So let me do some gymnastics with the laptop and we'll get over to some code and we'll walk through it. Okay, so this is, the, this is the promise library that I wrote, and what it's going to do is it's going to, it's got some interface classes, it's got some uh, things going on here, but what we're immediately going to do is we're going to set up uh, some retry logic, because with promises, if a promise throws an error function, you can automatically retry that. This is great for if you're doing like a API integration and the API times out. Just retry it. So I've set this up so that uh, we've got uh, retries, and here's our, our stack, our promise stack. Now, I call it a stack here. It's actually implemented as a list. And th every time you call the dot then method, all it does is add that class that you're, you're putting onto that promise stack. Okay. So if we scroll down through here, we'll also see that we've got this promise data uh, bit, and it's an object. The promise data, one of the things that makes promises very powerful is the chaining. But they're chaining things together is not very useful if you can't pass information from one to the next. So with the promise data and the way this executes, you'll see that it passes, it, it basically dependency injects the result of the previous promise into the method that is executed on the next promise step. This allows you to say, make a call out one, take its results, pass it into, into promise two, let it make a call out with some of that data, and then pass the results of the second call out promise back into Apex to save it into uh, the database. Okay. That's one of the critical pieces. There are uh, error handlers and done handlers, and we'll see what they, they work, how they work here in a little bit, but this class just says that you have to have one of each. And we've got a set of uh, constructors and some methods here. Now, I said that that then method, all it's really doing uh, is taking and adding 
the instance you're passing into it onto the promise stack. Let me pause here. I should have asked earlier. Can everyone read this okay? It's okay. We've got a good font size and everything. Okay, great. Now, um, when an error happens, we're going to call the error uh, class, the, the, the promise error. Now, this is a, an interface that basically says you have to have uh, one method defined, and this is where we're calling it. So if an error occurs, we'll actually attach the error handler and then execute it. Let me scroll down through here, and we'll, we'll go through the, the execute method. This is where the magic happens. Now, the uh, execute method is going to accept a queuable context, because this is, after all, based on queuable apex. And that you'll notice at the very top, I should have pointed out, it, at the very top, it also implements database.allows callouts. So you can make callouts from this. Now, uh, when we're looking at our, our code here, we're going to take the current promise, and we're going to take that stack of promises, and we're going to pop the first one off. That's going to be our current promise. We're going to execute that promise step, or that deferred step. Now, we're going to take the data, and we're going to say, uh, run, this, run this method with the current promise and data. And as we pass it through here, you'll get the, the results from the previous promise, if there was one, injected into the next promise. Now, the way this is set up here is we're, we're going to actually jump from the execute method down to the execute deferred. And this is going to call the resolve method. If we look, let me get my laser pointer here. If we go to the resolve method, we're going to pass in that data. And this is the method that you have to have defined on a class that implements the deferred promise step. So you implement the deferred int interface. You have to have this method. You define it. That's where your asynchronous logic occurs. Anything that's in that resolve method will be run asynchronously can make callouts, do all that sort of stuff. It doesn't matter how long it takes to actually run that, because it will finally return, hence the promise. Now, this is where I've, I've included the, uh, the, the retry logic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that retry logic here and uh, jump back up into the execute method. Now, the execute method, having executed the promise step itself, is going to say, uh, OK, great. Is there anything else for me to do? Or is this, am I the last promise on the stack? If there is another promise on the stack, it's going to call the enqueue method of the queuable apex and enqueue that step to get kicked off and pass itself in. Does that make sense? Is everyone, is everyone feeling this? OK. OK. Um, we have down here, these are the actual interfaces. So if you've got a deferred object, that's basically a step in your promise chain, in your monad chain. And that, you only have to have the resolve method. Why resolve? It's tradition. Uh, you have the error, you can have an error method. And with the done, you'll have a done method. Now, we can put all this together and actually look at uh, some very exciting uh, bits of code here. Let me switch to the other file. And this is actually the, the org in which I, I've uh, worked the promises stack out. So we're going to look exactly at how this works as soon as I get it back into presentation mode. I have a lot of inner classes in this file, and uh, I'm not entirely sold on the idea that that's the greatest way of organizing this. They can be their own outer level classes, but in this situation, for the sake of walking through it, I put them all in the inner, inner classes. Um, we've got steps here, and you'll see that I've got a regular class, doesn't really implement anything special. I like to prefix mine with a P for process, or promise. Um, but then as we go through here, I've got various steps, and various bits of information. Now, this first, this first one here is this deferred geolocate patriot class. And I'm going to expand that so we can see what's going on. And here's that resolve method that we're talking about. And in this case, we're going to take the, the Patriot's information off the case. And we're going to have, we've pulled it from the contact as well. And we're going to geolocate this using uh, GeoPoint's uh, geocode record API. Nothing terribly exciting, but this is something that we would have had to have done manually before. That takes a little while. And you'll see that I'm using this uh, other class 
inner class called case and contact to pass data around. This is sort of, I, I wanted to pass more than just a string or a value around, so I created an inner class, and I'm just passing instances of that inner class between the various promise steps. Neat trick, something you can easily implement. And as I go through here and I do my SQL queries and that sort of information, uh, I'm going to also have error handling in here. Now, if I throw an error, what happens? It'll retry up to five times in production, up to once in a, um, in a test class, the way I set it up. Uh, but let's say we get, uh, we get failures all the way down. It's failed five times in a row. What's going to happen now? The error handler is going to be called, exactly. Now, that error handler can do anything you want. I've got it set up to email me and to log inside the, the, the actual interface, uh, a little log saying this failed. But uh, here, here we go. That's, that's how our, our error handling works. Now, this technically, this is the only piece of asynchronous code here. I don't know how long it's going to take for GeoPoint to talk to Google and get a geocode address back. This is the asynchronous bit. If I was having to do this all in class, how would I have handled getting this and then saving it and then making another call out? I would have hit the, the DML record about not having, you know, I have unpending work waiting. Please uh, roll back or, or commit. So that's, that's just one step here. Now, if I go to the second step and expand it, There's actually nothing in this step at all that is asynchronous. This is a SQL radial search, nothing more than that. So promises don't have to be used with asynchronous work. That's just the way they were originally designed. Other things you can do with a promise is you can inject, say, batch handlers, do a batch job from within a promise step, and then you can chain together intelligently multiple batch jobs. Not just jobs of a single batch class, but multiple batch classes one after the other. That's pretty powerful as well. Now, the third one, this is the, this is the big one, the driving distance calc. And we've got a lot of code in here to, to actually grab the sorted radial search results and to uh, go grab the, the actual uh, geopoint distance results from, from geopoint. That all is asynchronous. And again, that's happening. Whenever that returns, I can continue on my calculations path. And when I'm done, I'll have actually an uh, object that has a sorted list of uh, accounts or, or partners that are the veterinarians and shelters and the distance from the Patriot's address as they entered it. When that's all done, the done handler is executed. And it's important to note that in, in traditional promise execution, the done handler is always executed. So I've made this platform, this library do the exact same thing. Even if there's an error, the done handler will still be called at the end of the promise chain. I do this so that at the very end of this, when I'm done with any of the, uh, any work that I'm doing, I can actually save a log or email myself, whatever's necessary here. In this case, I'm going to be persisting those, uh, persisting the data about the shelters and partners to their, to the case record. So the people who are viewing this can say, okay, they live next to ABC shelter or uh, XYZ DVM or veterinarian. Questions, ideas? How's everyone feeling about this? So let me show you the real magic of this and why I think that promises are, are actually amazing. I skipped through it here at the very beginning. And let me open this up. Excuse me, this one. This is the constructor for this process Patriot prequal class, or promise Patriot prequal process class. And you'll see it accepts one thing, the case ID. And that case ID lets us grab the contact ID off the case. We don't have to pass much more in than just the case ID. And then what we're going to do is we're going to immediately fire off the, uh, the promise chain. So here we've got our actual promise chain set up with defer geolocate patriot. Then we're going to call the radial search. Then we're going to call the driving distance search. Then we're going to call the persist information as the done handler. And if we have an error, we'll call the error prequal process. That's actually what I want to do. I want to do that work. I want to say, I need to do these steps in this order and call it a day. That's the power of promises. I, I've written this as the constructor, but it could be anything. It could be any method that actually uh, fires this off, creates this, and fires it off as one monadic chain. Now, um, 
Let me, let me pause there here and put that up there. Again, the, the power here is not in necessarily in, in making it easier, getting ready callbacks. It's it being able to expressively say what you're trying to do. Now, uh, let me show you some actual code here, some actual execution of this. And this is actually the, the form on the Pets for Patriots website. And let me make sure this is still running. Good. This is our uh, ye old developer console. And we're actually going to use this other tab here. We're going to put together a, a, um, an actual app, prequal application. So I am not looking for a service animal. That's true. I have not applied to Pets for Patriots before. That's not true. I do this all the time to test. Uh, a member of my household has not already applied. That's true. Um, I have not previously adopted. Yes, that's true. I am a veteran, sure, uh, for testing purposes. And I do have an email address that can be used. So about this, my name is... Kevin Testerson. And I'm going to say my email address. I don't have one of those. And leave that blank here. I'll put in my address. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know that we actually have, inf have the enough information to, to for, my, for me to be a successful applicant here. I don't think the shelter is near enough to me. But as we go through this, we'll put up the information. Um, I have never been convicted of a felony. I have, for the purpose, tests of purposing, I've got that. Um, I do want a companionship pet, and I'm adopting an older pet, or um, say a, a pet with special needs. So I do all that, and I click Send. And what's, this, what, what's happening here in the background is, this form data is being processed by a company called FormAssembly. Has anybody ever heard of them, FormAssembly? FormAssembly allows you to take really complex forms and actually create multiple Salesforce objects and that sort of thing. It's, it's kind of a poor man's uh, declarative API is the way I like to think about it. So the form is processed by them. It creates that contact record with all of my information. It creates a case record. And you see that I, up there in the corner, you see that I just got an email from Pets for Patriots. So, uh, Going through there, what it's actually happening, let's look at the, the code again. Um, not the code, I'm sorry. Let's look at the developer logs. And you can see that I've got some, uh, some things in here that are API-based. So let's just open one of these here. May have to search for the correct one. And that's, a, that's a GeoPoint execution. And look at this one. Here we go. So here's my driving distance search. This is the second to last step before I persist the data. And I've got all the logs for it. You can see it going through GeoPoint to pull up all the information. And here's, uh, I've thrown some logging in here so we can actually see what's going on. This is the results list that comes back and it has our driving distance and the ID of the partner. And it'll have information about what kind of partner this is. And as I set it up, I've got veterinarian, veterinarian, shelter, and shelter. So I actually do have veterinarians and shelters that are, live near enough for me to qualify. And as I keep scrolling down here, you'll see that it is going to uh, search, sort them out based on the max driving distance. So for a veterinarian, for a shelter, it's 40 miles. For a, um, for a DVM, it's 15. So I've got one at 17, I've got one at 67. So actually, as it turns out, I don't qualify. After all, doing all of that work, I found some that were within the radial searches. I thought I qualified, but then when it comes down to driving distance search, I don't. And if I were to pull up my record, I'd have to you know, figure things out here, but pull up the record, you'd see that I was rejected because we don't have a shelter or you don't have a DVM, a veterinarian. So again, uh, you saw all this happen in front of you. How long did that take to process all that? 35 seconds? That's the number I've, I consistently find that it takes. Some of the ones, uh, it's interesting, if you, if you live in New York City, it takes a lot longer because there's so many more within the radial search results to, to actually go out and, and grab distance for. But this is, uh, this is the process that it, you've, I've laid it out. It says it does everything and it writes it back to the, to the case. Uh, so I think with that, I'm gonna start back here on, um, on my PowerPoint if it, will let, if it will let me. Yeah. So I got some resources uh, that you can look at. First one is the actual promise library I put together. That's the class that you saw and the interfaces, et cetera. 
Uh, it's not perfect. If you've got ideas on how to make it better, please submit a pull request. I'm happy for those. And then the second one here is the Cubable Apex docs. Unfortunately, we don't have a trailhead or anything that really explains how Cubable Apex works. But if you read through the documentation and play around with it, you'll start to get a pretty good idea of how it works. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. That's a great question, and the simple answer to that is you can only test one deferred object at a time. You can't just test a, a, a full chain. And the reason that is is sandbox orgs only have a queue depth of one for Cubable Apex. Um, I've argued and argued about why you should have a queue depth of two for testing purposes. I got nothing. Um, what happens is you, you can effectively mock out your input and then instead of calling it through a chain, you call just that, that deferred class, which is resolve method, and walk through the, and test the resolve method. That's a great question, though. Glad you picked up on it. Yes? I would always use promises over future methods. Future methods have a, a lot of issues, re mainly regarding you're not able to, to chain them together. This is the big one for me. And also, you can't pass true objects into them. You can only pass primitives. So you can get around that by serializing to JSON and then unserializing. Eh, it's a big pain in the butt. Um, I would always use promises, or more correctly, I would always use queuable apex over at future methods. The one exception to that is if I need to do something asynchronously that's sort of fire and forget, and I, I just honestly don't care about it, I, I will call it an at future method. Um, and the only time that ever really comes up is actually when I'm using promises and I, I've got, I, you know, I want to persist some data and, but keep moving on. It's ancillary data that's nice to have. Then I'll call an at future method. Right back there. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Because each step in, so the, the question was, in chaining promises, how do governor limits work? How does that work with governor limits? Uh, it, it actually, this is, this is when I had my aha moment. Each step of the promise, each deferred object that you create is executed in its own Apex context. That's the joy of using Cubable Apex. So Cubable Apex, you enqueue something, and it's not until that, that one thing finishes that the next one is enqueued, okay? So you always have your order of operations satisfied, but each queuable context is actually written to the database and then picked up later by the, the queue runner and it's its own Apex uh, invocation, its own uh, transaction, for lack of a better term. So as long as you're not exceeding any normal Apex limits, rows, queries, et cetera, timeouts, in your actual resolve method, you're good to go. That was a great question, too. So that's a, a great question. If I tried to do all of this information at once, the number one thing I'd run to in this example use case is you have uncommitted work pending. Please roll back or commit. That governor limit you'll hit happens after you've made an HTTP callout. So as soon as I make a callout or some of the code that I'm using makes a callout, in this case, as soon as GeoPoint makes a callout, I can't save to the database. I can't persist information. So I can go get it, but then I've got to stop. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And this makes it really easy. Other questions? We had. I don't see why not. You'd have to get a little, little you know, fancy with where you're injecting the new promise, defer, the new deferred object into the, the promise stack, but you could definitely do that. You can insert and, or if all this fails, create a new list, add things in their order you now want, and then save that as the promise stack. Um, I haven't come across a use case for it yet, so I haven't actually done it, but I can see where that would be really useful. Yeah. Um, Mm 
Mm -hmm. So his question revolves around uh, another feature that is common to most promise implementations in other languages, and that's additional methods other than then. Um, so in JavaScript, particularly in the, in the queue service or in Bluebird or a couple of the other famous uh, JavaScript promises libraries, you have the ability to, to give it a, a list of promises and then call all, and it'll run those in parallel. This is really useful in a browser context where you've got you know, eight or 12 pipelines to, to use at once. Yes and no. If you created a, a deferred class that individually enqueued all of them at once, you could catch the end of the execution of all of them. Uh, functionally, the done handler does the same thing. The only thing I can't give you there is parallelism. Um, there are a lot of interesting quirks with the way this works on, on the Apex platform that make it challenging to really implement some of the uh, additional are handy, but not quite required. So that's a great question. Um, if you've got no idea of how to do it, I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay. Other question? Yeah. Yes, but I want to be real clear, the, the retry functionality built in as of now does not actually start in a new context. It's just, it'll retry a failed API call, uh, call out within that same context up to five times. I know how to make it kill, uh, kick off a new context. I haven't done that yet. The main reason being, if I kick off a new context, I run the risk of having an unkillable set of failures. Until I figure that one out, I'm not going to quite do that. Uh, there were some other hands, okay? I think that continuations and promises fundamentally try and, and do different things. They're both ways of executing asynchronous code. Promises, the goal of promises, the purpose of them is to make it easier to reason about asynchronous execution, to, to think about how the process needs to work. Continuations are more one-off and, you know, I need this to happen and, and come back, but I don't really need to put the, chain them together, do one after the other. Does that make sense? I've never gotten chain continuations to work. I tried a couple times. Um, not to say somebody else couldn't. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time to, to spend on it. This came out of a result of failed, failed chain continuations. And this has evolved really far from where it started off. It was just a bunch of, you know, Cubal Apex classes that all knew to call the next one into something that was a little bit more dynamic. Now with that one file from the Promises Library, if you just implement the deferred classes, the done and the error interfaces, in your own stuff, you're spun up and you can go. Yeah. I didn't show off the test code for it, but it's, it's pretty robust too. It's like 97%. So, other questions, comments, signed remarks? Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe neither one of them is better, honestly. Uh, batch Apex has its pros and cons. If you need to do something like promises but with massive amounts of data, you're going to have to implement it in Batchable Apex. Um, if you want something that is going to work 
because you're dealing with external data sources. Promises might be better because you can do things like retry within the same context. Um, I don't know that one is better than the other. I don't even know that one is more functional than the other. It's just what you're doing. I mean, you could, impl you could implement promises using batchable classes. I don't know that you could implement promises with batchable classes in a reusable way. That, that might be harder, but yeah. Let me see if I understood your question right. Could I write a REST resource that, that fired off a promise chain and then returned the data? Uh, I don't see why not. You have a couple of quirks that are going to happen. You're going to have a max reach, uh, response time on your REST request. <clears throat> um, you could probably do two or three steps, two or three defers in there. I don't know that you could do much more than that. Um, just because it's, it's, not, it's not the time your code is going to take to execute, it's the time that your, your code is waiting in queue before it's picked up. Um, and you can't, you can't even guarantee that it's, it's going to be seconds. It could be hours, right? Um, the good news is with the way the promises is built, it doesn't matter how long it takes for it to be picked up again. If it takes a day to pick up because there was maintenance or something in between, the entire promise stack is saved in that instance of the object that is in queue. So as soon as it picks that one back up again, your promise chain will kick back off again. Other questions? Yeah. Because of the way this works, there's only ever one from any given promise chain in queue at a time. Yeah, th that happens though if you're queuing multiple things at the same time. Okay, so what happens if you queue 10 objects at the same time? It's gonna say one right now, two right now, three right now, four right now, five in two seconds, six in two seconds, seven in three seconds, so on and so forth. Because of the way that this library works, it's you're ever only in queuing one at a time. So it's gonna be this one, and then when it finishes, it's going to say, okay, do I have something? Yes, and queue the next one. So it's you have your execution time buffering it in there. There is a practical limit in terms of what you, if you just, if you wanted to, you could write one that just queued other things just real, real quick, and you would hit the governor limits. The reason they do that is to keep you from basically using way too many resources. Other questions? We are technically out of time. I can be right outside if anybody else wants to ask questions or poke fun at me. No one is heckled. I'm disappointed. You've let me down. No. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.